Welcome to the Chess Angle. It's the season two finale. The Chess Angle is sponsored by Chessable. If you haven't tried Chessable yet, their courses are amazing. Chessable uses science-backed learning and the concept of spaced repetition to increase retention and ensure that you're learning the material. Check out Chessable.com today. There is a link in the show notes. For this interview episode, I spoke with one of the UK's top players, a prolific writer and chess coach, one of the great distinguished veterans of the game, Grandmaster John Ems. We spoke briefly about the latest chess news, including John's recent team win at the World Senior Championship, but the bulk of our conversation focused on tournament strategy and chess improvement. The basis of our conversation was John's outstanding book, The Survival Guide to Competitive Chess, which I highly recommend to all adult improvers who are interested in tournament play. It was first published in 2007, and I can tell you that it's still relevant today. I personally consider this an essential text for tournament players, and it was an honor to have John on the podcast to speak about it. And I have to say, John is one of the nicest and friendliest people I've spoken to, not just in the chess world, but generally. So let's get to it. My conversation with John begins right now. Hey, John, how are you today? Welcome to the podcast. It's an honor to speak with you. I really appreciate you coming on today. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. And thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm looking forward to chatting. Absolutely. No, it should be good. We have some great uh, topics to discuss. So I need to start with this, of course, Magnus announcing that he will not be defending his title. I guess he's done with the world championship. I figured we'd start with that as an icebreaker just to get your thoughts on that whole situation. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, um, I mean, for me, I was I was actually looking forward to another Magnus against Nepo match because I actually thought it would be I thought it was going to be a, a really um really tight match actually this time. To me, even the even the first match it was incredibly tight until um, until Magnus won the the long sixth game, and um, Nepo is somehow. He's, he's simply just kept a really good level, hasn't he? Basically, win, I mean, winning two candidates in a row is just like an amazing achievement. Um, so for, for one thing, I, I was obviously a bit sad about that. The other thing is that, you know, um, I think that it's going to work out absolutely fine. I think that basically if Magnus has lost his motivation to play, I don't think there's really any any sort of compromise that would have been that Fide maybe could have done with the time limits or anything like that. I think that we're already, he's already on this sort of slippery, slippery slope as in he, he obviously wasn't keen anyway. So any, I think that basically, I think this, the natural events is going to be fine as in we'll get a new world champion, but Magnus is still going to play and we'll see how it goes. And I mean, you know, I'm, I'm now kind of looking forward to a, um, uh, to a Ding Nepo match actually, basically. So, you know, <laughs> Uh, we do. We just don't know what'll happen in the future. Maybe Magnus will play again, um, but I don't think it matters too much. I mean, part of being world champion, not that um, you know, <laughs> not that I know about these things, basically. But part part of being world champion is the actual motivation of doing all that work. And if Magnus feels he can't do it at the moment, then you know, it's up to Nepo or Ding to sort of take the mantle. So. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, I mean, obviously, yeah, we've had a lot of uh, Magnus fans saying, "Oh, the uh, world champion is going to be devalued and everything." But I, I don't really agree. Um, I think both of the both of those, uh, both Nepo and Ding, would be uh, would would be worthy champions actually. And in fact, actually, I think so. I think someone was. I mean, someone mentioned uh, uh, somewhere I can't remember where. Where um, if throughout the history of chess, there's been many occasions where the best, the, so the number one rated player in the world. Uh, wasn't the world champion. Uh, in fact, if, if, in fact, even if you just go back to um, the last two or three years of Anand's uh, reign, probably, uh, I mean, Magnus was the best player in the world for the last two or three years there. 
And uh, I mean, Kramnik, obviously, a fantastic achievement to beat Kasparov, but but surely in those last five years of Kasparov's reign, I mean, he was probably still the best player in the world, wasn't he? He, he generally he generally won all, most of the events. So it's not unusual. I don't, I don't think it's going to be a problem sort of having um, Nepo or, or Ding as world champion. Yeah. So, all right. Yeah. See what happens. And again, you know, he's Magnus is what? He's he's 31. He's still a young pup. So, <laughs> yeah. So we'll see what happens. All right. So now congratulations are in order uh, for you, John, and, and your, your team, because you recently won the over 50 section of the World Senior Team Championship. And, uh, I mean, this is quite a lineup. It's you, uh, Nigel Short, uh, Keith Arkell. Am I saying that right? I hope. Uh, Mark Hebden and, and Mickey Adams. I mean, that that's quite, <laughs> I'm just, that that's quite a lineup there. So uh, I, I'd love to hear about that. Now, big win for the UK, because not only your team won the over 50, and correct me if I'm wrong, the over 65 team won as well, and the women's over 50 team. So I, I'd love to hear about that experience. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think, I mean, actually, uh, I think it's, uh, we, we say Keith Arkell, basically. We don't, we don't go Arkell. Arkell. Okay, so, yeah, something uh, told uh, yeah. me I wasn't saying it right. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for correcting me. Okay. Uh, but, I mean, actually, I've, I've definitely heard Arkell as well. So, you know, that, that sounds fine. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was an amazing experience. Um, uh, and amazing, obviously, for England to win, to win three world titles. I mean, uh, I've actually, I've been to, th- this is the third one I've been to. Uh, I went to one in 2018 and one in 2019 as well. Um, and we came close in 2018. We got the silver medals. Um, but this is the first time we actually managed to win it. Uh, in fact, both both occasions before, um, US had, had won it. Um, and convincingly as well. In fact, in 2018, I think we, we actually beat them in, the, in our individual match, but they won all their other matches, basically. So, um, yeah, they, I mean, in this time, they had a pretty formidable team as well. And to be honest with you, it was really tough i mean they were they were just you know not um giving up and they were just we i think we drew our individual match against the us in in round four and um but then they kept winning their matches we kept winning our matches and finally in the penultimate match we managed to win and they drew against hungary so we were able to pull clear so it was, it was really really tough and but it was a fantastic um feeling to actually to win a world title and um this time, just like the last time, I was captain of the team, and but somehow this time I f- kind of felt sort of like uh, the weight of being captain. I, I, f- I sort of felt the responsibility of making decisions more this time. You know, uh, I kind of realised you know there's there was a lot resting on sort of what to decide of who to play in each game. Um, Previous I, I, times, it, it, maybe it was easier. On other occasions, it, maybe the decisions were just more straightforward. Um, so, so by the end of the tournament, it's completely shattered, um, and it, it, it helps enormously. I mean, so obviously, we had a really good team, and it, uh, and we had on numerous occasions, we had players who just sort of stood up and bailed us out as well. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah. So it was really great, uh, and. Um, uh, yeah, well, I can't say any more. Just very happy to come back. Um, no, I, I'm just curious. <laughs> no, that that's fantastic. I'm just curious myself. What did the prep look like for you and your team? Now, was this the kind of thing like, well, you know, we've been doing this a while. Let's just go have fun. Or was there some serious prep? Was it a little bit of both? Um, so there was no uh, pre-tournament prep. Um, so we didn't get together or anything like that. Um, Generally, yeah. Generally speaking, there was no real prep. We didn't. We didn't. For example, we didn't help each other uh, prepare for games. Um, most of us now are just so far set on our ways that we can kind of we just do our prep yeah, ourselves, kind of basically. Yeah. yeah, you know, sometimes. Yeah, I guess so. I, I would imagine, even at your level, it gets to a point where you know what? Let Let's just have fun. Let's not overthink it. Analysis is paralysis. I'm just going to play tough and go in. And you know, I was. I guess it was kind of that. Uh, not exactly. I, th- I mean, each individual player would prepare how they'd normally prepare in an, in an individual tournament. Right. But each individual player is different. Some players like enjoy the process of preparing openings, I assume you mean mainly, about preparing for their opponent. Sure. Um, other players prefer to just uh, relax a little bit and, um, and, and just uh, sort of uh, get themselves ready psychologically for the game without doing too much opening preparation. 
Um, however, I mean, you know, there was the occasion on, on one game where one of our players got into trouble in the opening and lost the game. And I did think after that, I thought, actually, it might be quite good at sort of just at lunchtime just to ask people kind of like, what are you playing today, basically? Just in case there's just a, like a little little bit of information that might be useful. And um, so we did do that after that. And we didn't have any, I don't think we had any more accidents, at least. Um, but um, Now, are there certain, any, I don't want you to give anything away here. Are there certain openings that you used consistently or that you favor that you used in that tournament? Um, no, I mean, me personally, I just used, well, I, I mean, I'm just using my openings that I'm studying at the moment, really. I can't really, I don't, we didn't make any, certainly didn't make any team decisions on using certain openings. I mean, for example, I mean, Mickey Adams and Nigel Shaw and, uh, well, all, all of them, I mean, Mark and Keith as well. They're just so used to playing their openings. They're pretty active um, players. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what is more like a, a, what we might happen is that someone might play, an opening uh, plays a lot more flexible these days. They play a lot more openings. So if someone says I might play the Karakhan today and, um, and someone sort of knows about a recent idea and they would say, well, that's an interesting idea or, or, or be careful of that idea. If that opponent plays that against you without giving too many, you don't have to give too much details because some, because once a player is aware of an idea, it's then very easy for them to research it. So you don't have to give them, you don't have to say this, 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 and this, it's just someone, sometimes the mistakes are made in games simply because someone's not aware of a particular line. And that's the problem. If it gets sprung on you and you're not aware of it, it's more difficult to deal with it over the board. You have to put all your energy into that. Um, it's much easier if you've got some, something at least a little bit planned, basically. Um, and this, these, this, these days, there's so many different ideas um, that it's, it's, it's not easy to keep abreast of all the developments, basically. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, cool. All right, so let me change gears a little bit. You are a prolific writer. I know many people listening, if you have a large chess book collection, I'm sure at least one of them was written by John. Um, you know, I'm a fan of your work. You know that. Can you take us through the process of writing a chess book? Like, just in general terms, I'm curious what that looks like. I mean, are you spending time with databases in an engine and and like, how long does, you know, I'm just curious, that whole creative mm. process of writing a chess book, maybe you could tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, first of all, I should say that uh, we say a prolific, prolific writer. I guess um, I was, I, pro- I haven't actually written that many books in the last seven or eight years. So I've kind of took, I've taken a little bit of a break, um, but certainly between sort of like um, sort of late nineties and, 2012 i wrote yeah there was obviously yeah, quite a lot I was gonna of books say you had you had quite there. a quite a run there i did have a run yes exactly yeah um so I, I guess i've been incredibly lucky that i've always found the actual process of writing a book um fairly straightforward and maybe that's just a, a personal thing um i think um others others might struggle um but it's just something i've been lucky that it's just uh, i've been okay with that and maybe I've been, maybe I've, I've probably about, I don't know, 70 to 80% of the books I've written have been opening books. And I've always find, found them very easy to structure. Um, especially if I've already studied the opening, then, you know, I, I find sort of like putting, sort of like um, uh, structuring the chapters very straightforward. Um, and uh, then most of the work typically, um, and I'm sure it's the same now, it would be uh, done in, done in chess space, um, or or a similar program. Okay, um, and uh, so that's where you sort of do your annotations, your analysis. You could use an engine. Um, you can paste games into into other games, um, and you would end up with some sort of ch- big chess space file. And then the next stage would be to kind of convert that. Well, actually, I, th- I guess it depends on the publisher. I mean, some publishers would actually just accept a chess-based file, and then they would take it from there. They would they would then produce the book. But typically, the way they would do that, um, or, or whether it's the publisher or the author, um, they would um, somehow convert a chess-based file into actually, a, uh, for example, a Microsoft Word file, and then um, and then they would that would be edited and then. Um, and then convert it into a PDF and then print it. Um, 
if you're doing a printed copy of the book, of course. Okay. Um, if if you're doing a an sort of an ebook, uh, then I'm not sure how that would work, but I imagine it's fairly straightforward to do. Um, so for as far as the author's concerned, I would suspect that I, actually about ninety percent of the work would be doing stuff in chess space, assuming the book is a hugely chess uh, has huge chess content to sure. it. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, if it has loads of written uh, work, then I guess most of that would be done in Word anyway. Okay. Um, but I mean, I think again, it's like for me, it was much easier doing an opening book than, um, uh, for example, the survival guide was tougher because it, it's less obvious uh, what should go in and what should stay out and how how to structure the actual chapters. Um, but for openings, it's easy. You just sort of like do the main lines and then you do the, the the lesser lines or some people start with the lesser lines and then go into the main lines, right. basically. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. No, thank you for that. I was, I was just, I was, I always wondered about, you know, cause you, you we have all these checks books. I always wondered about, you know, just the, the process. So, mm. uh, I mean, before, before, um, I mean, you know, in the old days before chess space, I imagine it was really difficult, you know, typing up, typing up all the moves, basically. Oh, I, I, um, <laughs> I can't imagine. I don't even want to imagine that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Right. So uh, it's, it's probably it's probably easier now than at any time to actually. When I say easier, it's never easy to write a chess book, but the actual um, the tools that you have make it make it easier. So you you can just focus on the actual content, basically, um, okay. which is obviously the most important thing. All right. So one more thing I want to discuss, John, before we get into the survival guide, and this is actually a good lead in. I know you're a very active chess coach now, so I'm just curious. Maybe you could tell us how you got into coaching, and you know what age level uh, you're coaching now. If you have any specific coaching philosophy, um, you know, because I, I know you're very active as a coach, so I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I started coaching. Um, it's not something I really just went into as such and said I'm going to be a coach. I started coaching when I was a player, probably, um, probably about 30 years ago. So, um, at that stage, I was still a very active player and I was going for my, I mean, initially I am title then GM title, but I would, I would do some coaching, um, uh, and mainly, mainly junior players. I was living, um, and still do, I was living in an area of, um, uh, England called Kent and they, they have a very active, uh, and still do have a very active junior participation organization with uh, doing lots of tournaments and also coaching days. So I kind of um, got gained some experience there. And also I'd go on the occasional sort of um, uh, sort of English Chess Federation trip with juniors, sort of accompanying juniors to uh, international tournaments like World, World, Champion, World Youth Championships and European Youth Championships. But it, having said all that, I, I was still at that stage, mainly just, I mean, you know, 90% actual to player. Um, and it's only really since around about um, probably around 2013, 2014 that I've started doing coaching more and it's got to a stage now it's, it's virtually full time. For the last five, six years, it's virtually full time. Um, so that's kind of like been the timeline for, for coaching. Um, I, this, I generally, most of my, most of my students are, are junior players. Um, and, uh, most of them are, uh, very active players, ambitious players, basically. Um, and that's obviously, I'm very happy to work, work with those because it's, 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 it's far more rewarding for me, um, than re working for someone who's not, who's simply only playing a little bit, basically. Um, so, um, and also about two years ago, I started working, um, started a job with, um, uh, called the Accelerator Program. Uh, with um, some other coaches or one other coach and another a manager. And um, and that's uh, sort of sponsored by um, the Chess Trust in, in England. And um, so we we have 10 students currently on our on our books. And again, they're all very ambitious players. And, and it's, it's been a fantastic experience being able to work work with those. Basically, that, that's the kind. So um, I also do, I actually do some schools, local schools as well. Um, although in the last, last couple of years, I have cut back on that because I've enjoyed the one-to-one -one coaching so much. I've, I've really enjoyed that. Um, somehow I, you know, um, I, I need to do quite a lot of research with that and I'm very, very happy 
to do that. Um, so, um, yeah, that's the kind of um, the work I'm doing at the, at the, at the moment, basically. Okay, now, just a quick question about your approach to coaching. We don't have to do too mm. much of a deep dive, but are you are you focusing more on is it like here's the theory you have to know, or is it you know your mindset's completely wrong? Like you're 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 lacking confidence. Is is it a little bit of both? Um, I think it's a bit of everything, really. Um, I think that one of the main one of my main philosophies is is to try and get the student to become more independent and more independent thinker and not just to sort of, you know, <laughs> just copy or, and just try, rather than just sort of learning and revising stuff, actually take ownership of their work. Um, so just an example would be rather than just simply um, getting a, an opening um, uh, repertoire and a certain opening from a coach and then just saying, I need to do this. I need to do this revise, 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 just to actually sort of like either getting using sources. Uh, it could be a coach's work or something or, or something from Chessable or something, or usually a mixture is much better. And then actually sort of like saying, you know, taking ownership of that work and saying, this is mine. I, I'm going to like um, really look at this and, and question it and actually sort of like say, you know, what, why do you do that? And if I'm not satisfied with it, then you know then then choose something else basically yeah so actually sort of like you know sort of like foster their curiosity so they actually because i think most of the, most of the best chess players are just that's what they do yeah they they're curious and they don't sort of just sort of like accept things <laughs> uh they they question yeah um i think you you need that to be a strong player um so it's it's kind of like uh, trying to I guess actually sort of um, yeah so, uh, sort of try to make students so in, so sort of like um, so yeah it, more independent um, enough so they probably don't need you anymore basically I guess. <laughs> well, that, but, um, that's the point. That's the point of yeah, education, exactly. right? Is that they don't? Yeah, they don't need exactly. You yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, clearly, you know, there are going to be times when that that's that they're not developed enough for that to be the main goal at that time yeah they have to be a, they have to be a certain sort of standard and uh, age maybe or, or maturity chess maturity wise to, for that to work so you can't just i don't think you can go straight in and do that um but you know that's i think that's always at the back you know back of your mind that's what you want to do um uh with their chess and then you know um yeah i mean obviously there's there's, there's so many aspects obviously as well as that um but yeah that's something that i, th I think is actually uh quite important yeah great excellent okay so now we're going to change gears a little bit one of the main reasons i asked john to be on the podcast was his book the survival guide to competitive chess it's fantastic it came out in 2007 it's still relevant today and a lot of it really has to do with the thought process and decision making on the board we're going to get into some of it now but John, what I'd like to do, I want to just read uh, just a few sentences from the introduction and then, you know, get your reaction to it. Maybe talk a little bit about why you wrote the book. So this is what John writes. And I, I think this is very, very well stated. This is almost like eloquent. There comes a time when every chess player will look at himself and ask, am I performing to the best of my ability? Do my results really match my understanding of the game? Why am I drawing games I should be winning and losing games I should be drawing? Why am I making silly mistakes? And why is my rating not improving or even worse going down? This has certainly happened to me on more than one occasion. And most recently, I realized that some new action was needed. The results are within these pages. Now, I, th I think that's something a lot of us can relate to. So maybe just give us a little bit of background about the book before we get into some of the specific uh, topics. Sure. Yeah, so I wrote the book in, in 2007, I believe. And uh, I think by that stage, I was, as by that stage, I, I was playing much less um, uh, because, I mean, I think by then I was working virtually full time with for every man chess and uh, it didn't give me much time to play. And, I, you know, I'd obviously by that stage been playing for 30 years, I guess, since I was about 10. So, you know, it, um, I just... 
I felt it was like a good time. I just wanted to kind of basically reflect on um, on my games, just on my play. Um, and at that stage, I was I was, I was working, um, obviously doing lots of writing. Um, I wasn't actually doing much coaching. I was doing a little bit. So I didn't really have that much to draw upon there. So I simply thought, I'm just going to look at all my games and, and see what I can learn from that. Um, and it, but it kind of mean, it kind of meant that it was probably the most personal book I'd written, I've written basically chess wise. And I, I was just surprised when I looked at it again. I was kind of just, I think about 80% of the examples were from my actual own games. And, uh, clearly, um, you know, obviously most of the examples also was probably from when I was also already at least an international master or grandmaster. So, um, you kind of, you, that's what I wanted to do. And you kind of hope that it will benefit other, other players, but you're never going to be sure it will because there's, there are obviously differences in standards, aren't there? Basically. So you can't, you know, and, and, and basically if I wrote the same book again now, I think it would be slightly different because I'd probably, I'd have more coaching experience to, to draw upon. Um, but I still, you know, I, at the, you know, I still thought there was some value to doing it. Um, and I think I mentioned in the introduction that, you know, grandmasters or, you know, master title players do make exactly the same type of mistakes, at least psychologically. Um, that's as, an interesting, um, that's an interesting comment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not the, basically the, the, often the sort of the, the, the level of chess mistake is slightly different, but it's the same psychological mistake is made basically. Right. Um, which is what, you know, which is obviously important. So, um, yeah, and um, that, that's mainly that was the reason. That's the main reason I wrote the book, basically. Um, yeah, to just to ref- I, I just thought it'd be very interesting to reflect upon my games. Okay, well, I mean, I can tell you as an amateur player down in the ranks that it it definitely is helpful. I think class players of all levels can can get something out of this book. So what I'd like to do now, John, is we'll do sort of like uh, four segments. I kind of want to look at each chapter. And maybe we could look at a few highlights. I'll kind of just mention some concepts and kind of let you run with it. So the first chapter is called In the Heat of Battle, which is about calculation and avoiding blunders, but from a very pragmatic viewpoint. So you start out with a rule called CEM, check every move. So maybe you could tell us about that. Yeah, check every move. And it was it, it's it's not the most uh, eloquent sort of uh, I thought I could, I pro- these days I probably come up, maybe come up with a bit something a bit snappier but um yes basically I think when I started playing full time um just after I left university I was, I was I think I was around about 2300 standard and um I was just at that stage my calculation process was very random um and i i realized i i needed to improve it basically um i was i was seeing a lot of things i was quite quite creative seeing a lot of things um but my my process was just completely unstructured and i think i guess it it had it, been that way all the way through as a junior basically and uh, I, um so and i always felt actually that i mean my, i think probably my my biggest problem and this, this hasn't got anything to do with the, uh, the CEM method. Was my I was, my visualization wasn't as strong as players of similar standards. My strat- I was quite I was good at strategy and quite good at end games, but my visualization sort of like uh, held me back. And probably, um, I mean, that was simply because I didn't do enough training on visualization when I was younger. And that's probably the best time to do it when you're young. Um, however. I felt that if, as long as I could kind of structure my uh, thought process in the game, that would improve my actual calculation process. Um, and so I sort of like, I, start, I don't know how it happened. I didn't, actually, I didn't actually sort of train at home. It was simply I played a lot. So I was actually using my games to actually sort of like try and force myself to start thinking differently. And... Um, I was simply playing every week and also during the week as well. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't solving calculation exercise at home. It's simply all by playing. And I was, I just started thinking, well, you know, sort of like, why don't I just, for example, 
when I'm actually um, checking my, my opponent's moves, why don't I just do one piece at a time? <laughs> And also, why, if I'm checking my opponent's queen's moves, why don't I just check their queen move down a file, then the queen move along a rank, and then the queen move along the diagonals? And it just sounds so simple, but I'd never done that before. And it, you know, and it, it basically, it just worked really easily. And it, you know, just having that structure meant that I can, what's the word? You, you basically, what you do by doing that is that you see the possibility. Okay. And that, that, is actually the most important thing. If you see the possibility, then you then realize you, you have a possible candidate move. But a lot of people just simply just don't see, you just don't, you know, because the actual actual possibility, because of human biases, for example, just escapes them. For example, they, you know, if they're looking at que- a queen move, they'll simply jump over a square because that square is on pre. The queen will be on pre. So it's not even, they don't even, it's what I'm saying, they, instead of actually, they'll just, jump from c3 to e3 missing out d3 because that the queen will be on pre on d3 okay whereas if they actually say queen d3 oh they can take it oh but then i've got this then then you see that's a can they move of course it might not work but the fact is you've, you've actually seen it's a possibility then and then you can you can start looking at it um and to be honest with you um i don't actually remember previously that being sort of recommended in in I might be wrong, but I, don't, I, I didn't see it previously being even suggested before. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something, to be honest with you, it, it helped me a lot. And I think actually it was definitely one of um, the main, that uh, definitely one of the main reasons that, that I was able to get to a Grandmaster level. Because, okay, I, I improved the openings as well and, um, and uh, end games and strategy. But I don't think without, without that, I'd have just kept failing at calculation, basically. Um, so, I think the the CEM method was uh, mainly about um, a lot of it was actually about um, using it. I mean, you can use it every all the time, but I think that it was most useful in if you've already worked, if you've already got a main line, you, like you can see an idea, and it kind of you can see it's got a great chance of working. Yeah, but what do you do then? Do you play it? No, you need to kind of verify that it actually works, and um, and uh, that's yeah, that's where. Um, you know, I was, I was using this method of like, okay, that uh, usually usually on is actually on your opponent's move as well, basically, because you're you've got your whole like main line, like you're going to do queen moves, they move, rook moves, they move, etc. So your main line is in your head already. That's the that's the idea that works. Um, however, uh, you you're going to have to before you make your first move, you're obviously risking something, so there might be some risk, um, and then. You need to basically, if your reward is very high, you need to like check all their possibilities, basically. Um, yeah, and th- that's that I found I found very very useful. Right, and and you talk about that in the chapter also as an extension of that. You say we should avoid high risk, low reward tactics. Yes, exactly. Now that was something as uh, I, for myself, I was you know that wasn't so important because i was able at that stage already you could i could sense immediately whether something was high risk low reward um so but i what i found is that that is that is an issue basically for many players um and uh of all actually maybe of all levels actually i think um i think it's uh what causes it sometimes is like and i think this is a, 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 again a common problem is that players sometimes don't like to keep the tension in a position. They want to resolve the position, basically, um, and for good or bad. And often, and occasionally it is for bad, basically. Um, right, so like trading, the, uh, trading because you can, or just trading because it, exactly, it feels good. Yeah, yeah. yeah now that the, the high risk, low rewards example I gave was something where actually allow, playing a move which actually allows your opponent to do lots of different things basically um so the idea is that you make a move which allows your opponent to do the first capture in a sequence of trades and you might be able to see for example that one line works out well for you um and then but there are seven or eight other lines your opponent can do basically at that stage the sensible thing to do would simply be probably say no i'm not even going to look at that because at least one of those possible captures my opponent can do is going to be at least fine for him. 
So why invest all that time? And the, especially, like I said, this is the low reward thing. If the best you can hope for is a slightly better position or maybe winning a pawn, um, then that is quite a low reward for a, for a move um, where um, you're either going to have to spend 45 minutes calculating every single line and then even then you're not sure you know you might be a waste of time because you might in your 44th minute you might might work out that your opponent's got a good response <laughs> um or you're going to have to play on some sort of blind faith which obviously is not a great idea either um so yeah uh, i think that it, it it is a fairly common um uh, problem um i mean there was there was there's a game from the candidates um I think it was Nakamura against Duda. Um, and, uh, I mean, this again, this is a high level version of, 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 of high risk, low reward. Basically, what happened was that, uh, Nakamura was white. I think it was Nakamura against Duda. Yeah, it, it was, yeah. Nakamura was white and Duda, uh, it was complicated, very complicated game. Um, but, um, Duda kind of outplayed Nakamura just for a few moves leading up to this position. And uh, I think uh, what happened that Nakamura had sacrificed a pawn, but then Duda found some really good good idea, and then he had kind of consolidated his pawn advantage and was then fine, albeit in a very still a very complicated position. And then they got to this position where I think both sides had about um, twenty minutes left, and Duda had the option of playing a very natural move, which kept his pawn advantage but still kept lots of tension in the position, or do the move he chose to do, which basically gave – there was some reward, but it seemed, it wasn't clear what that was. And, but the thing is it gave Nakamura so many different possibilities, and Nakamura just quickly found the best one. And Duda actually psychologically collapsed after that. He Basically, he realized, pre, he realized at that stage, like, why did I do this? Yeah, and in fact, I was, list, I was watching it on Chess 24, or one of the, and uh, the commentators couldn't believe he'd done it, basically. And But I think probably the reason he did it is that uh, clearly he wouldn't normally do it because he's such a strong player, but he, he felt the pressure. He wanted to resolve the situation. He couldn't, he couldn't play. He didn't want to play this move that kept his advantage, but kept the tension. <laughs> and he just went for it and Nakamura played this move. And actually, even though Duda was still okay after that, he, the, the, the trend then was all in Nakamura's favor and Nakamura actually, Duda missed some other stuff after that and Nakamura won. So, um, yeah, so it can happen at highest levels too. All right. Okay. Interesting. Uh, one, one or two more things from this chapter, because this is really good stuff. You talk about bluffing. Yeah. In chess. <laughs> Very interesting. Tell it, tell us about that. Cause you know, people who are bluffing, they're thinking of like Texas Hold'em and, or something, you know? Mm. So w- what is, what is bluffing in chess? And of course, for everybody listening, all of these topics, everything's in the book. I'll have a link for it. But of course, we're hearing from the horse's mouth directly, Grandmaster John M. So, tell us about bluffing in poker. In uh, in poker, listen to me. <laughs> in chess. Yeah. yeah, I know nothing about poker, so I can't comment there. But in, right. in chess, um, uh, yeah, basically, um, I guess bluffing is well. I guess there is there is definitely some bluff in chess. I mean, for example, uh, just even just some sort of pawn sacrifice, where. You're not sure of its soundness, but if you if you've done some research on your opponent and um, you 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 realise they're not they don't enjoy accepting sacrifices, then you could use that information to to, to bluff them basically um, in that way. Uh, I was trying to think the example. Oh, yeah, probably the. I mean, I'm, I'm probably this is a this is probably a section of the book I would probably rewrite if I was doing it again. Because um, the, the the examples I gave were one is one game I I uh, I did I did kind of bluff and it went horribly wrong. So my, my I think it just in general I, I don't think it's a great idea in general in in chess to bluff, um, um, because usually the best moves win the game. Yeah. Um, you should always be on the. You should always be trying to find the the, the best objective moves and playing the position on its merits. Um, however, there are there are examples where I th- where I think it works, or, or rather, it's at least a, a, a possible solution. And um, sometimes it might be in positions where you're already perhaps in a little bit of bother, 
and um you know in the flow of the game you need something to change the flow of the game basically and um and you know if you make a move that you feel is objectively the best but simply makes it too easy for your opponent to play then it might be better to give make a move which you're uh, we'll say at best unsure about and at worst actually knows leads to a big, uh, a big advantage to your opponent because at least it gives them problems to solve. Yeah. I mean, obviously chess is all about giving your opponents problems to solve. So if they, at least if they've got problems solved, there's some chance they won't be able to solve it. Yeah. Um, or they might even shy away. If that, I think, I guess the bluff, bluffing part of it is them actually shying away from the problem and not actually confronting it at all. Uh, I think one that's what one of the games one example I gave from one of my games where I played a move which looked much more natural than the move I thought was the best move, and in the hope that my opponent simply wouldn't take this pawn, I'd seen some quite long tactical idea where probably taking the pawn was a good idea for them, but I simply couldn't bring myself to play a move which defend the pawn which looked kind of so passive. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean. I'm not sure. I I think I think it's something that could be used. Bluffing is a sort of something that can be used um, from time to time, um, but not basing your whole strategy upon it. I think. Right. Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I like what you said. I mean, if if you're if you're already worse, maybe like as a swindle, like there might be specific. It's not like you want to do this every game, but I think that there, like you said, I think there are specific circumstances, depending on the position and your opponent, where that might you know be your best try. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, I suppose what you're saying, what you're saying is actually, well, bluffing is like a part of the swindling package, I guess, isn't yeah. it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, in that respect, definitely. It, 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 yeah. It's, it def- it's a good weapon then. But uh, I mean, the first game I gave where I, I just basically bl- uh, bluffed a pawn in the opening, that wasn't a good idea because I was just, I mean, I'm perfectly well placed. So there was no need to do it. My opponent called my bluff and just, in the end of the, well, I just ended up lost position after 20 moves of white. Right. Um, yeah. So, it's like anything yeah. else. Sometimes it's going to work and sometimes not so much. <laughs> yeah. So uh, last thing from this chapter, you talk about the poker face in chess. So tell us about the poker face. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think I mentioned a couple of opponents that I played and it's going to be, it'll definitely be more of them as well. I mean, there's just two that came to mind that I, I struggled with enormously um, and that was uh, Mickey Adams and uh, Mark Hebden. Now, obviously, Mickey Adams, uh, I struggled with him enormously as well because he was like a, a higher class of player, you know, um, and most of the time I played him, he was already 2,600 and, and uh, even more. But um, uh, whereas Mark, he was more, I think he was a bit higher than, rated than me for a lot of the time, but there's also a lot of the time where I was, we were kind of level rating as well. And um, I, I found it very difficult to play against those two in particular because they were very, they gave no information away, very impassive. Um, whether it, you couldn't tell whether they were, were, were winning, losing, drawing. And, um, I, th- that, I think if you're able to control your emotions, um, and not give anything away like that, I think it, I think it, it benefits you, both you as well. Um, but also it, it's actually off putting for your opponent who's, who's looking for any signs of change throughout the game. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, um, I just, well, I don't know what the top players are like, but obviously, obviously, I, mean, I just remember, obviously Kasparov somehow he, he just showed all his emotions, didn't he? Oh, I was going to um, say that that's a bad example of, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a but non, funny enough, actually, yeah, non-poker yeah, it's a bad face. example. Yeah, he was a non-poker <laughs> face, but fun, funny enough, he had such a personality, it, it kind of put his opponents off anyway, because a lot of his, I mean, a lot of his kind of expressions were kind of like, um, Kind of sneering at his opponents. <laughs> oh, he had that stare, yeah. right? The Kasparov yeah, stare. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, was, yeah, it's nasty. Um, <laughs> yeah, but um, I think a lot of the players these days, a lot of top players, are, are fairly poker faced, aren't they? Um, I think it, in in general, I think it's that's a good idea if you're able to do that. Um, I I don't think I actually gave any advice of how to do it. I mean, basically, maybe because um, obviously. Um, no, I don't remember. Um, you know, uh, and uh, I, I, generally myself as well. I think probably I was, I was probably quite able to do that as well. Um, um, I didn't, you know, uh, 
so but I, yeah i'm 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 not you know someone like kasparov for example maybe he simply wasn't able to right basically but of course yeah. the less information you give away yes exactly you know yeah. i mean we've all been there yeah. where you you make the move and of course you realize it's a blunder 10 seconds after you make it and you're just kind of like mm, you know let me grip my teeth and like everything's fine and you know you hope your opponent doesn't you know take advantage i mean that happens at the amateur yes, exactly. level all the time yeah so mm. yeah i mean um i was going go back to a, um an example of a game i had against mark hebden which is in the book um yeah he we we just uh, i was under pressure and we we're getting towards the time control i was slightly worse and he was completely poker faced as usual and uh, on the last move of time control he, he just casually played this move e3 pawn from e4 to e3 which uh you know, if this is just the natural, most natural thing in the world, like, you know, it's just been a continuation of his previous dominance, basically. And uh, it was just a blunder. It was just a blunder. But basically, because he just played it with such a straight face, and uh, and I think he realized at the time it was a blunder as well, or as immediately after he moves, but there was no reaction by him. And that, I think that was move, that was black, that, he was had the black piece, and that was move 40. So I had I, all my extra time, no t- no time problem. And I just just simply didn't see the way to refute it. I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't, think, I didn't even think there was a way. Basically, I just assumed that it was a good move. And, just um, based on his re, on his reaction or his non reaction. Yeah, not even for that move, but just for his last few moves. Basically, yeah, mm-hmm. it all just seemed part of the natural process of him improving his position. Um, I mean, it was a tactical move, but you know, as in like in, there were some pawns were attacking each other now, and there, there were some tactics. But um, yeah, I, I just reacted very poorly to it. Now, um, I mean, I guess if I'd have, um, if I'd have maybe, I don't know what I did to that game. But I mean, if I'd have uh, taken some of my own advice, like taking a break after time control and and, uh, and uh, used employed, I think I may even mentioned employed the CEM methods, then I, I should, probably should have seen how to um, how to get out of that. But yeah, part, obviously, partly the fact that he had the poker face, um, you know helped me there uh whereas if i'd have been playing gary kasparov maybe i'd have seen <laughs> yeah <laughs> right okay yeah yeah that's so. funny all right so let's move on to chapter two which is called winning drawing and losing really about playing with the result in mind now, there's some great stuff in this chapter i'm going to kind of jump out of order a little bit i want to talk about draw offers all right because you have some great stuff in there because especially at the amateur level, there's different philosophies that you should never take a draw. Personally, you know, I think, and you say this in the book, that choosing to accept or offer a draw is something that can actually, you know, boost your rating. But it, it's something that's fascinating to talk about. So just get, give us your thoughts. And, and again, you know, you're a coach as well on, you know, draw offers. And sure. especially with, yeah. with the, you know, the amateur player in mind. Mm. Right. So um, first of all, I mean, uh, if I was doing this book now, I'd, I'd have it would, be, it would be definitely slightly different um, because of my experience with chess coaching. Um, I think I'd have less emphasis on draw office in the book. Okay, um, and I think actually, uh, I guess the book was more or less about. It was more about making them you making most of your chess talents as they are uh, to improve your results. Uh, it was more about that than actually progressing as a chess player, if you see what I'm saying, and improving mm-hmm. as an actual player. Um, and yeah, obviously with draw offers, there's there's the two things: there's the maximizing your results. Um, as you stand at the moment as a like a, a, a your standard but also there's the flip side of course as a developing player you have to you, you think about draw offers in a different way um so as, if you're a developing player i mean an improving player or, or at least someone who wants to still keep improving then yeah it, it, i would it would it's probably better to take a different approach with draw offers and maybe take a, even a really hard line approach like never offer draw as in you're seeing every game as a learning experience and you want to basically uh demonstrate both to yourself and your opponent probably more so to yourself actually 
that you're willing to fight in every single game to the very end. And you're willing to learn more about end games and play them out rather than just agree a draw. So your whole mindset is like about improving at chess and then results will take care of themselves, basically. Um, so that, that's a slightly different approach. Obviously, in the book, though, it's all about basically how do you actually use draw offers to get the best result, which is obviously something different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and generally speaking, um, I guess draw offers mainly are a weapon for the higher rated player against lower rated players. They're not usually a weapon for lower rated players against against higher rated players, although obviously uh, maybe against players of similar standard, they can be as well. So a typical example would be um, a higher rated player or a stronger player against a, a, a lower rated player, for example, sees that the flow of the game is turning against him. And there's, there's actually sort of like, there's nothing he can do about it. It's, these next few moves are going to happen whether he likes it or not. And the lower rate of play is definitely going to play these moves because there's no other option. And at the end of this sequence, basically the lower rate of play will have a big advantage on something that's going to be difficult to turn around. Maybe even an end game, it might just simply just be a win. So the idea is that the higher rate of player will offer a draw before they reach that situation where it becomes clear. Um, uh, Because that's his last chance, really. Apart from, obviously, the lower rate of player going wrong, um, probably going wrong after the sequence of moves. But then if they go wrong, it's, you know, it's probably like, it's not, the higher rate of player will see they they won't even win anyway. It'll either be a draw or a loss. So that'd be an example of using a draw for there for the higher rate of player. Um, And, um, Another example would be just simply, <laughs> I think I called it a draw by draw by reputation, basically. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah. And again, that's just again that's just the higher rate of player. Basically, this time it's not a slightly different situation. The higher rate of player is again worse against the uh, someone lower, um, but it's kind of like they're just offering them a deal. Basically, you know, do you want to trade in your good position for some rating points? Yeah, <laughs> it's just a, it's yeah, it's just simply a deal. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you about draw by reputation, right? Do you want the rating points, or you know, do you want to lose the game? And you know, so I guess it's a little bit like cashing in on a bet, isn't it? Before it before it actually goes, yeah. You can you basically you can get some rating points now. You get them for free. I mean, you draw against me, so you get some rating points. Or do you want to go for more? Uh, and uh, you know, and uh, but with the uh, danger that you might actually lose, even from an advantageous position, yeah. And uh, so, um, and the high rate play might, to be honest, the high rate play might not even want them to accept the draw. It's just, it's just a gamble. So, and like, um, it might just to sort of, just to sort of like put some doubt into your opponent's mind. Uh, having said that, this is uh, there's the flip side: is if a high rate player offers a draw against a lower rate player, it might actually confirm to the lower rate player. That the uh, the stronger players got a bad position as well. If they had any, if they hadn't previously had any doubts, so you 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 are you are giving some information away as well. Um, so you know there's some risk to the strategy as well, um, but it's it is yeah, it certainly it certainly can work. Um, and again, probably if if the lower rated player was an improving player, developing and want to improve, my advice would always be to play on. <laughs> Basically, again because. Um, you know, um, if they're valuing uh, their, you know, if they've got a growth mindset and they, they're valuing sort of like uh, uh, experience against a strong player, then then they should absolutely play on. Right. So I, I think to summarize this, if it's really more about rating points in the tournament, that's where the whole draw offer thing can come in. But if it's strictly just about improving as a player, play the position out. Would that be your like a yeah, you, I mean, long, long, yeah, long term, long term. Uh, Strum, we play the position now. Then, of course, there might be if you're if you're playing in the final round of a championship, etc. You know, um, then you know, obviously, sometimes you just need to draw to win the tournament. Of course, then, of course, yeah, yeah. Um, but the general long term strategy should be to play the position now. It's interesting. I, a, a few months ago, I actually decided to look at um, Alareza Feruza's first. Um, I think 200 games on chess base. Um, and I, th- and this is between the age of, I don't know, I can't remember exactly, maybe between the ages of 10 and 
14 or something. Um, uh, and I, I checked and he, had, I think he had one agreed draw, um, before move 25 against, and there, uh, he'd play the, uh, most, a lot of these games against really strong players. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. And it just probably just shows his mindset. I did check Magnus Carlsen actually as well when he was very young and he actually had more draws, but, um, maybe it's just sort of like the character thing. It obviously didn't hit, hinder Magnus these a few quick draws, did it? <laughs> Basically, yeah. Uh, um, okay, great. All right, so one more thing from this chapter before we go to chapter three. You talk about converting winning positions and you know mistakes such as poor trading, so maybe you could tell us about that a little bit. We'll be back after a quick break. To some extent, we're all still trying to figure out what we want to be when we grow up. In fact, it was from that struggle that I started my podcast, Career Sweet Spot. I'm Steve Perkins. I'm the founder of Greenhouse Coaching, and together with my team, we explore everything about this topic on our podcast, Career Sweet Spot. We share ideas, practical steps, and insights we've gathered from coaching thousands of individuals and companies. On Career Sweet Spot, we like to joke and have fun while also tackling the biggest topics intentional people are thinking about in their work, their leadership, and their life. So why don't you press pause and hit subscribe to Career Sweet Spot, a podcast all about life and career growth. Yes. So this is like if you've got a, a position that's is a very big advantage and with best play should be... Uh, should be a win, basically, with best play, best play for both sides, um, and uh, either a, either a middle game or an end game uh, position, and the sort of things. Uh, I mean, I think probably the best advice I can give, if let's say you're material ahead, the best advice I can give is generally try to play the position still to the demands of the position, as if you're not material ahead, as if you're you're still your as if you're level. So still try and basically um, play what you believe the strategically best decisions. Um, so, um, so the, the uh, for example, if you're a common mistake is simply just exchanging pieces. And I think I'll give an example. <laughs> I was a queen up, queen for two pieces up, wasn't I? And I just, I just swapped my bishop for the knight and then realized actually that wasn't a good idea. Um, <laughs> I can't believe I did it now, basically. But um, yeah, I, did, and I just left him with two lovely bishops, and I had no dance square control, and I couldn't even, I couldn't even, couldn't do anything. We just agreed to draw twenty moves later. Um, so that was an example of just poor trading. Um, and the way you should view it when is like actually think about what exchanges are fair. I mean, they, they obviously the advice you everyone gets when they're younger is when you're up, exchange pieces. Yeah, okay. Um, but what? What's not told, what you're not told is like, it should be fair exchanges. And also what you're not told is that basically the, the, the value of pieces, um, is flexible throughout a game. Okay. So the sort of mistakes that players make, if they're sort of like a pawn up or something is that, um, they'll exchange a bishop for a bishop because it's an exchange. But what they won't look at necessarily is, is my bishop worth more than their bishop, for example? Yeah. Um, or they might, let's say, for example, you're a pawn ahead or even two pawns ahead, whatever. You're some, some material up and, um, you have a chance to exchange Queens. Okay. Um, the, the decision about exchanging Queens should be more about, should I exchange Queens strategically rather than should I exchange Queens because I've got, because I'm two pawns ahead. So if, if, for example, your opponent's got a weaker King than you. You should probably keep the queens on the board because that will mean that their king is in trouble and you've got much more chance of actually winning the game. Okay. Apart from if you, for example, pe the reason people might do it is they don't want to blunder their queen or something. Yeah. <laughs> so they exchange queens. But then what might happen is if they exchange queens, their king's no, their opponent's king's no longer vulnerable and might play an active role in the end game, which might make it harder for you then to, to, to sort of, sort of like, um, exploit your two pawn advantage. Um, so it's very easy. People kind of sometimes like, and it's a bit, it's a bit like um, uh, soccer, or football, I call it, but of course soccer in England. It's like a, there are some teams sometimes that you, you're able to kind of like um, be two goals ahead and then sort of, you know, wait for 90 minutes 
But in chess, you can't quite do that. You have to actually win the game, basically, yeah? You, the, the referee doesn't blow a whistle and then say, I'm two pawns up, I've won the game. <laughs> you have to actually win the game. So, um, you know, you have to actually you have to actually use your advantage. I think that's the point. People are sometimes afraid to actually use their advantage in the actual part of the game to make give them a bigger advantage, basically. So when you're two pawns ahead, people might get a bit passive. They go into this sort of consolidation sort of mode, um, start exchanging, and they don't actually use their advantage of like, you know, if they might have two, be two pawns ahead on one side of the board, and that's where they need to actually use and exploit it, and that will win the game. Um, so, um, again, I think it goes back to also um, – players are sometimes afraid of just keeping the tension they want to exchange they think, they, they think it gets them nearer their end goal and sometimes and unfortunately sometimes it, it actually doesn't so that's the example of poor trading um what's the other uh well you talk about cashing in too quickly and, yes again well, yes exactly yeah and yeah. avoiding tactics yeah now cashing in too quickly is similar to poor trading in the in the fact that players are often very materialistic so as soon as they see in a chance to cash in their initiative for like a pawn or two, they'll do that. And again, it, the, the way to combat that is to try and view things more f- like view th- material is simply just one part of the game. And uh, the fact and again, the flexible value of pieces. So if you're swapping off your really powerful bishop to win a pawn and but you're swapping off their knight at the same time, are, are you actually winning material? Yeah, is your bishop maybe worth five points at the moment? Their knight's only worth two and a half. But if you if you swap it off and then win a pawn, you're not actually you actually maybe lost in that trade. You actually lose in that trade, perhaps. Yeah. So um, you know, uh, and and just sort of embrace the tension as well. Don't just try and sort of like, yeah, uh, you know, sort of like um, try and sort of avoid all um, complications basically in the position. Um, and I, I think I gave an example where I did that in the game. Uh, and I've, I've certainly, I've certainly been guilty of doing it in lots of games, actually. Um, but again, I think that is a, that is a common mistake, um, and it, it is all to do with being uh, of, uh, of uh, valuing material above or, or too much, basically. And uh, and the other one was um, yeah, avoiding tactics and um, um, trying to win a game without any using any tactics at all. Now, obviously, some players like to or, or f- see themselves as very positional players um and um and certainly there are definitely games that are won without any tactics or or rather maybe perhaps without any major tactics at all very minor tactics perhaps um usually between players of levels of quite a bit different basically um but um also players who avoid tactics um what te- what tends to happen is they just miss miss out on sort of like lots of opportunities basically um and it's actually quite difficult to win a game just by avoiding tactics um and just sort of like uh, yeah you, you what often happens then is that your sort of advantage will just fritter out basically um so again it's a much a much better solution rather than to avoid tactics because you're because you feel that's not a strong point of your game is to actually um, practice and improve your tactics, so you get to the so you get to the position where you are much more confident of actually using them. I think it's like a again, it's like a shortcut, isn't it? Trying to avoid tactics again, and it's it's not it's not going to be a it's not going to be um, a long term successful thing, basically. Now, chapter three: clock control and time trouble, which is. That's huge. That plagues, you know, players of all levels, but especially those of us at the amateur level. And that can often, as far as I'm concerned, if you, you're you having clock control issues, I think you would agree, John, almost, you know, you could know all the theory in the world. And, you know, if you're constantly getting into time pressure and blundering, but I like how you start the chapter, you go long think, wrong think. So tell us about that. Yes. Long think, wrong think. Um I guess um, I think actually in the book I kind of recommend not spending more than thirty minutes on any particular move in the game. Um, 
and probably these days with the shorter t- I mean time controls getting sh- even classical chess now is shorter isn't it it's, oh yeah i mean it, our yeah. club just just to give you some context yeah the, i mean a, a lot of players you know they play at the club level like ours is game 90 with yes, okay. a yeah. 10 second delay so sure. you know yeah. what i tell some beginners i'm like you know you can't be spending like 6 minutes on move 2 or something like that but, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. Please yeah. So, so for example, even in a critical moment in a ninety-minute game, you wouldn't want to be spending more than fifteen minutes, even if it's a sort of like a very critical moment, basically. Um, okay. okay. Um, because um, typically, when you have a long think, after a while, you're getting uh, diminishing returns. In fact, after about fifteen minutes, probably your thing, you're going around in circles, and you're, um, you know, you, you're you're sort of like. Uh, you're not think you're not actually seeing anything new necessarily then, and you're probably going you're getting it's getting confusing. So you have to sort of like uh, at some stage have a cut off point and then make make a decision. Um, if your if your calculation process is fairly structured anyway, it sh- if you can if you can improve upon that, then it shouldn't take you so long anyway to come to decisions even in tactical situations. Um, so. Sometimes I think when I was playing full time a lot, I would I would actually I would actually have a cutoff point, uh, you know, um, of around of of around about fifteen or twenty minutes. I think it was um, that solves that problem. There is a, obviously there's a problem of some some players simply also just it's not just one move. It's like a, just a sort of like lots of different moves sort of in a row, maybe making six moves in an hour or something. So they're not spending more than 15 minutes, but <laughs> you know, that's a probably, that's a more common problem. And I think it's kind of like, um, it's, it's like being very, what, what you need to do is be very practical on the sort of, sort of small decisions, basically. Yeah. Where, you know, sort of like the 50, 50 decisions as well. And once you, you also have to know your, know your limitations. Like if you, there's, if you know, sort of, there's no way you're ever going to work out to like to absolute certainty which move is better than the other, but they both look pretty okay, and it's a strategic plan anyway. Then you know, it's like say, do you play rook AD one or do you play rook FD one? What do you do? Rook AD one, rook FD one. Uh, what do you do? In fact, the answer is you do either, but don't spend 15 minutes thinking about it. Basically, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, old, the old witch. We've talked about this on the podcast before. It's the old oh, okay. witch, the old witch rook scenario. Yes, right? exactly. And you yeah. waste you waste you know twelve minutes when and you know you put it in the engine. It's like the difference is minuscule. So it, exactly, it, yeah, yeah. And then that's time. And it, yeah, yeah. And interesting enough, I've, I'm, I'm pretty sure as well. I've seen games, even top players, they play they play a move like rook ad one, and then even if they realize it's not the best move, they can. Position's not that. It's quite quiet anyway, the position or something, and they can kind of just move it back and then move the other rook to D1 in a couple yeah, of right. moves' time. It often doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and also, but in a couple of moves' time, things might clarify, and then it's so much more easier to make your, then make a choice then. So, um, you know, um, uh, yeah. And obviously, another problem is that people come often try to come up with some grand scheme, basically. Uh, you know, sort of like some overall scheme that's going to win the game all the way to up to move Z, basically. And uh, where well, you should really be f- kind of focusing on just very small improvements in your position in those type of positions, like you know, what's my worst place piece or something. If you can't think of something to do, just what's my worst place piece, or let's just try to improve that. Yeah. Um, and in it, in it, to be a, a minor improvement, basically. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, some again, like, but the but the idea of keeping the tension. Don't be don't be scared of keeping the tension, but just improve a piece, and then and then make you, then it's your opponent's decision about what they do, basically, yeah. Um, and then you can, and of course, another thing, of course, that it, um, helps is simply, um, simply, once you've made your move, you know, that's not the end of it. You just start keep thinking in your opponent's time, especially it's about strategy. Um, a lot, of, you know, sometimes you do need to get up and everything, but if if you're actually at the board. Then you, you should probably be working, yeah. Actually looking at the position and not just sort of like looking around or looking at other games or something. You know, a lot of players just get distracted by what their teammates are doing or something. Yeah, it might be all very exciting, but um, you know, anything that you, it, it's much better if you are going to take a break to simply think about nothing than than another game. Um, and people do do that. It's just very easy to get into those sort of habits, especially if you're playing a, a team competition and like um, it's important. Um, and you might argue that, oh, I need to know what's happening just so in case my opponent offers me a draw. 
But usually what tends to happen is that your parent, your teammates can sort of look after themselves. <laughs> and uh, it's better for you just to focus exactly what you're doing on your game. Um, so that's the kind of like avo- trying to avoid. Oh, well, another thing um, I should mention is if you're able to play openings where you know the middle game plans, so you've studied the middle game plans before, then you, you're in that nice position where most of your time will simply be in during the game will be focused on calculation. It's so much harder, of course, if you're actually trying to actually come up with a plan. That's just sometimes very difficult to do, isn't it? Even if you have two hours on your clock to come up with a plan, yeah? Um, it's much better to know what the, the, the masters have done previously and then just copy their, <laughs> copy their plans during the game, basically, yeah? Um, so that's kind of like um, possibilities to avoid time, time trouble. Um, and John, yeah. if I can, you also talk about, because I think this is an issue for a lot of players, you talk about exploiting your opponent's time trouble because a lot of mm. people do that incorrectly. Like you might have a good position and your opponent is low on time and a lot of people mishandle that, right? Yeah. Yeah, me included. Yeah. I've done, I mean, I actually remember a lot of games when I was younger where it, it would, would have about 15 moves before the time control. I had about half an hour. My opponent had about two minutes. And then what might happen is that I'd spend about, th- I'd spend about three minutes on a move, make a threat. They'd, they'd immediately stop it. I'd then spend another three minutes on the move, make another single threat. They'd stop it straight away. And that, that this, this thing would just keep happening until we got to about, uh, five minutes before the time comes. Suddenly, I had two minutes left as well. They had, we both had two minutes left. Nothing had happened apart from I was making single threats. They were stopping them. And then, because I wasn't in the, because now I had low time, low time, and I wasn't used to making moves quickly. Then I'd just make a blunder or something because I, I wasn't, I wasn't in the. They were in the zone, and I wasn't basically. So, um, what I was saying in the book is that's something you should try and avoid: just making single move threats. Um, and in fact, sometimes the if if you're sometimes it's actually better to make no threat at all um, because then that gives your opponent, you know, so, or, or rather a move that looks like there might be a threat, but in fact there is no threat. Um, and um, then that leaves your opponent sort of like they can't react to anything. Then they have to actually do something and they have to make a move which doesn't actually harm their position. And that's sometimes harder to do than a move that's actually just reacting to a single threat. Because they have to, they they react to the threat, and they think, well, you know, I have to react to that anyway. And if it harms my position elsewhere, that I have to, that so be it. Whereas if you make a move that doesn't create a threat, just a gradual improvement move, they ha- they then feel like they need time to sort of make a move just to make sure, oh, what do I need to do here which doesn't harm my position? Um, so that's one thing. And the other the other thing is, um, I talked about the uh, the barrage method which I think um, Simon Webb named in his fantastic book, Chess for Tigers. Um, Great book. Which I got from there. Yep. Yeah, fantastic book. Yeah, I, I read that a few times when I was much younger. Uh, a great book. And um, and that was the, if you are, in, basically, I think what I've said, first of all, is if, if you've got, if you're in time trouble and you have lots of time and you have a significant advantage already, then just play on as normal. If you've got a big advantage anyway, where, and playing normal moves will likely win you the game, don't do anything different. However, if you've got a position where you're just slightly better, or it's level and quite complex, then um, if you are going to enter a tactical sequence, the idea would be to rather basically think ahead so that you can play more than one move very quickly. So rather than the three move, rather than three minutes make a move, they reply three another three minutes make a move. The idea would be you you can see what their replies in advance, and then you should visualize the position you might get in three or four moves. So then it would just be you move, they move, you move, they move, you move, they move, and then you move, and then they have got something difficult to work out, and they don't have the time then that you have been thinking to solve it. Um, so that that is definitely an, a, a possibility. There's a slight danger. In that, in normal chess, you would still you should still spend a bit of time in between your sequence. So you have to be confident that the sequence of moves you're making that you're not missing anything. So, but that's where your say ten minute think when you've got half an hour and your opponent's got two minutes. 
because they don't know which move you're going to make then. So the idea is you spend quite a bit of time and then it's move, 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 move. And then you're, then you're, hopefully your opponent has got a big, big problem to solve at the end of it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the barrage technique. And of course, I think he's in his one, he said that you did it with even without um, recording your move, but you, you unfortunately you do have to record your move now, don't you? Right. Yep. According mm-hmm. to the rules. That's yeah. the rule. Yeah. But you can still do it. You can still, you can still do it. Yeah. All right. Which brings us to chapter four, which is all about opening play, openings, and preparation. So let me kind of set this up for you, John, and I'll let you run with this as you will. You talk about choosing an opening based on style and quote unquote winning the same game twice because you're sticking to the same repertoire. So maybe you could tell us about that. Yeah. So I think actually when you're choosing your opening repertoire, the most, obviously, a big decision, maybe the most important decision is, is like which openings to play. Um, so you, you have to be quite careful. Uh, so, I mean, you know, it's easy to just to like find a course or a book and, and say, oh yeah, that's really good. And, you know, um, uh, you know, the author's done a great job or anything, everything. And, uh, you know, um, but if the opening doesn't really suit your needs for the, for the stage you're at, at your chess career or whatever, um, then it doesn't really matter how well the book is written or whatever. It's, it's, it, it might not be the opening for you. Um, yeah, I mean, there's quite a lot of questions to ask yourself when you think about your openings. And, and um, one of them would be sort of like, uh, do you want a sharp sort of opening um, or sort of a positional one? Um, or, or both, of course. Yeah, you might, you might want both in your repertoire. So you, have it, you, have, you gain experience of both types. OK, but what sort of percentage of sharp ones, what sort of percentage of positional ones do you want? Uh, do you like do you want openings that are uh, open or closed? Yeah. Um, do you want um, openings with sort of fixed structures? For example, Sicilian Shveshnikov, you, you more or less get this typical type of structure, don't you, all the time? Um, do, you, do you want to uh, do you feel more comfortable playing those? Is that going to be is that going to be easy for you or something more flexible? For example, um, Sicilian Taimanov is more flexible where, for example, for black, the E pawn might go to E6, but they might then go to E5. The D pawn might go to D6 or D5. So um, uh, likewise for, for, for D pawn openings, like the King's Indian, is you, you tend to get a fixed structure there most of the time. Or, or, or do you prefer sort of like Nimzo Indian where, again, you can sort of like uh, the pawn, pawns can be in any sort of structure. Um, and I guess also big question as well is sort of like uh how much time do you have and do you actually enjoy opening study i think that's that's a really important point if you actually enjoy opening study um that changes can change your approach for example a, a, a big decision you have to make is sort of like do you want to have high maintenance openings or low maintenance openings okay so do you want to have like for example low or, maintenance Low maintenance, Low maintenance. Please. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so for example, and but also again, it, you might have a mixture because just so that you 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 experience different types of openings. But it's probably not a good idea, for example, if you don't if you don't like spend if you don't actually like opening study that much, and you don't yeah, and you don't actually have that much time for it. It's not a good idea to fill your repertoire full of Nardorfs, Grunfelds, um. You know, yeah, right, Kings right. Indians. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you might prefer, if that's your, you might prefer Queen's Gambit declined or Queen's Gambit accepted, for example, if you want a more open position. Um, C3 Sicilian, for example. You know, there are lots of examples you can find, um, you know, as long as you, you, what you have to do, first of all, is make those decisions and then you'll be able to find the openings that suit you. So, for example, if you, if you don't like lots of theory, um, although to be honest with these days, it seems like every opening has quite a lot of theory to it, but, you know, if you don't like really sharp positions with lots of theory, but you like open positions, then maybe the C3 Sicilian is a good opening against the Sicilian. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and likewise, you know, this, this, this is easy to make, uh, to make those decisions. Um, I think I, I often say for a, uh, a developing player, someone who's improving, um, this is slightly off the point, but I think it's, it's, I think it's good for them to choose openings that have at least one pawn exchange, basically. Um, I think for young players and those who, you know, sort of just starting out, 
I think it's not a good idea to play openings, for example, where there are very few porn or no very few porn shows. So, I, I would, for example, I wouldn't even if it's a nice system that's easy to learn, I wouldn't recommend like the King's Indian Attack, for example, uh, for a youngster, simply because they should be at that at their stage they should be looking to play slightly more open positions where their tactical skills can develop, basically. Um, likewise, I probably wouldn't recommend the London system. Okay. Oops. <laughs> I sort of have, that's okay. I sort of have a reputation for playing that, but that, but but you know what, John? We, we I want different points of view, so I'm I'm curious why you don't recommend the London. Yeah, I mean, um, this is be for a developing player, someone who's started out in chess, okay. and um, again, it's the point that London system is l- less likely to open the position up very quickly, so you're going to be more likely to get blocked positions. And right. no pawn exchanges. Not a so lot they're of not exchanges, gonna, right? Okay. Yeah, not a lot of pawn. Well, pawn exchanges. I mean, yeah. Um, so it, you, they won't. You know, um, they're not getting such great value in learning about pawn breaks. Um, so um, I think the London system's better than the King's Indian Attack, for example, because um, um, and uh, it's a good shortcut to start off with. But I, I, again, I, and it's actually, uh, to be honest, again, it's, it's all, I think it's balance is, is the important thing. If the, if the London system is just one opening you play as part of your repertoire, that's fine. As long as you're getting some openings that where you're going to get open positions, yeah? For example, E4, E5. Um, and, uh, but even there, I, you know, try and focus on uh, lines where, where White's aiming for D4 fairly early on, basically, as yeah? some sort of pawn break, yeah? Um, I mean, you know, uh, again, well, a typical opening uh, that juniors all play is like the Italian game, isn't it? But the one where you don't, where the knights come out to C3 and F3 and the bit, yeah, there's, there's basically no pawn breaks at all. Mm-hmm. Sure. And um, it, often you just reach very, not very exciting positions at all. Whereas the, the lines for white and for black where an early D4 is played, like, for example, a C3 and D4 by white, you get, I think players are able to develop their skills more quickly, their tactical skills more quickly if sort of like um, faced with that sort of opening, basically. Okay, great. Okay, so we covered a lot of ground. Now, for those of you listening, there's a lot more in the book that we didn't get to. I just wanted to get some highlights, but I want your thoughts on one final thing before I let you go, John. Tell me, you know, what your thinking is about internet chess and speed chess. You know, should players do it? Shouldn't they do it? Obviously, with the pandemic, and the Queen's Gambit, we sort of have this surge. We, we're in a little bit of a chess boom now. A lot of like adult beginners, adult improvers, but even, you know, kids, everybody's playing like blitz games and internet games. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, no, in moderation. I'm very curious what your take is. Okay. Um, so uh, blitz chess and rapid chess online. Um, absolutely. Yeah. You do as, do as much as, it, as you want. Um, and, uh, funny thing is actually that over, as I said, over the pandemic and the lockdowns, we had some examples, certainly in England of, um, players who'd hardly played before playing lots of blitz and rapid chess online. And then at the end of the pandemic, suddenly being very, very strong players simply because they've played about 10,000 hours worth of chess online. Interesting. Um, Okay. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I'm just laughing. I okay. I didn't. I didn't expect that answer. I thought you were going to say in moderation, or no, that's interesting. Well, I mean, there maybe they had. They didn't have much choice. That's what they had to do. I mean, basically, I suppose they're just doing the. It's like the Alpha Zero playing against itself loads of times. Yeah, they're just simply doing it trial and error. I guess. Yeah. And who are we to say this isn't? This is a wrong. If, if it works, it works. Yeah. Um, Someone who, uh, in particular, someone, uh, 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 there's been two or three examples. I mean, someone, I'm not going to name any names, but I, I remember seeing someone who had a who had a, a rating of around about 1,000, but now is playing at sort of like um, 2,300 level in about two years, basically. And he's playing over, over the board, basically. You know, um, I think it's, that was in a rapid play there. But certainly very, you know, very good. And simply, I just checked, I checked his account on Lee Chess and he played, he played um, I don't know, 5,000 blitz games, 5,000 rapid play games or whatever. And um, now, what you, of course, what you need to do, though, is that um, for it to be beneficial um, playing blitz or rapid, let's say, let's plus, say 5 plus 2, 3 plus 2, 10 plus 5 or whatever, 
Um, should be with an increment, by the way. Okay, you, basically, you should always if you want to if you want to actually use this thing to improve your chess, it should be so that the game is decided by chess and not by who's got the quickest mouse and who can pre-move. I mean, basically, if you're doing all this pre-move stuff, that's that's not helping, of course. It's fun, but it's just, yeah. So, the, you know, if you play 3 plus 2 or 5 plus 2, 5 plus 3 or whatever, yeah, some increments so that even your end, even your end game skills can improve, um, that's going to help. Now, uh, there, there should, yeah, ideally, if you assuming you can play over the board chess as well, there should be absolute some moderation to your online uh, blitz as well. Um, the the point being is that why how it helps you is it's, it's just very good feedback. You just get this feedback, don't you? That's the main thing. So if all you're doing is just playing, and all you do is play, then probably you're not getting much a great deal of benefit. Um, although even the feedback you get during the game can help you. Now the way you could really benefit, of course, is that you play a, let's say you, you play a certain number of games. Let's say you play about six games in an hour or something, uh, various rapid play blitz. And then after that, you actually look at the games afterwards and and check um, check what you did in the opening, check with your opening files if you do have any, or uh, what you should do. Um, uh, check with the middle game plans, what the top players do. Um, so it's just this continuous feedback loop, which will then help you in, in, in other games. And it will also, crucially, it should help you, if we're talking about improvement in standard play, it should help you in standard play, basically, if that's your main goal to improve at standard play. Uh, Blitz and Rapid can can help you. It's not it's not so much necessarily what you during the, do during the game, but what you discover afterwards, basically. Um, yeah, that's how that's how um, Blitz and Rapid play uh, chess can help you. You can also, um, I mean, I, I certainly for when I was playing in standard play tournaments previously, I would also use internet chess um, uh, to play what's known as uh, I think daily daily games. Um, these, these are the ones where, um, uh, you, um, I think you get, a, a, like you're allowed to play a move a day. Um, but what you can do is that you can use that, um, that, um, format to sort of like practice your standard play chess. So like you can, you know, you, you obviously got a whole day to play a move, but you don't, you don't use a whole day. What you do is that you, um, just spend three minutes on the move like you would in a classical game, basically. So you can actually use um, uh, sort of like a daily chess to as well, because um, my my feeling is that there there aren't many. There's not actually a great deal of opportunity to play standard play chess online. It, the players are um, the there aren't. There's not great sort of like uh, there aren't many players who want to play. So you might be waiting around for a long time. So John, thank you so much. This was fantastic. Uh, we're approaching about an hour and a half, so I, I don't want to keep you too long. But this was great. It was an honor to speak with you. The book, everybody, is The Survival Guide to Competitive Chess by Grandmaster John Ems. We'll put a link for that. Um, I'll speak to John as well about any other links he wants to include in the show notes. But, uh, John, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a, uh, it was a pleasure to be on. Thank you very much. So that concludes our second season. I want to thank Chessable for sponsoring this show. I want to thank all of the guests who have been on the show so far, and I want to thank all of you, the listeners. This show is a success because of you. It means a lot that you take time out of your busy lives each week to listen, and I sincerely appreciate that. So this was technically a 40-episode run because the break between Season 1 and 2 was only a few weeks, so this was a long stretch, and the plan is I'll be taking off all of August and probably the first few weeks of September as well, I'll still be working on the podcast, making notes, lining up guests, but I definitely need to step away from having to drop an episode each week, and then I'll come back fresh for our awesome third season. Once I have a date, I will, of course, post that on Twitter, on our website, and in the main podcast description. If you're just discovering the podcast, this is a good time to binge the episode you missed, and then you'll be all caught up. So good luck, everybody. Be well, and as the song goes, I'll see you in September. Thanks, everyone.